Good evening to everybody. I'm Joy Rio, as some of you know from previous programs. I'm the host of the Counteract Climate Change Project, and our executive producer is Susan Edwards, who is also on the call tonight. Uh, our goal is to bring you inspiring planet protectors with all their ideas, big or small, to help us change our ways and not change the climate. So tonight, we are talking about the dangers of light pollution. And our guest presenter is Tim Brothers, who is the manager of the MIT Wallace Astrophysical Observatory. And Tim is also the vice president of the Massachusetts chapter of the International Dark Sky Association. So tonight he'll be talking to us about the problem, the, the solutions and what we all can do to help. And I must admit, I was humbled by what I didn't know when I started looking into this topic of light pollution. As a lifelong environmentalist, I thought I knew uh, more than I did. So it's uh, this is gonna be an enlightening program. There's so many aspects of uh, light pollution to discuss. It'll be hard for us to cover all of them uh, in this short hour. We aim to talk for, uh, have a presentation for about 40 minutes and then to open it up to live Q and A for the last 20 minutes of the program. So we'll see if we can get all that done because there are so many facets of this problem to discuss. But the good news is we can do something about this. So Tim, we, we really appreciate your, your time tonight and um, your expertise. It's not very often one can talk with an astrophysicist. <laughs> so uh, welcome to the call and uh, take it away. I know you have a lot of slides to share. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank all 90, 92 of you so far that have that have showed up tonight. Uh, I, I can't tell you how heartening it is uh, to see what a progression we, we've made. Uh, that what started out as a little group of us uh, astronomers years ago, uh, trying to spread the word that we were worried about the stars disappearing. And as we connected with uh, a variety of other people, environmentalists, medical doctors, policymakers, um, and everybody in between. Uh, realizing what a, a wide, broad spectrum of problems and what a fast growing problem this is. Uh, and so uh, my slides are pretty dense. Uh, don't feel like you have to read everything as we go through it. Uh, there's some extra technical slides for those who are engineers or scientists or if you just want to know more. Uh, but I'm going to try to also do something different that I don't normally do, which is uh, one, I, I've, I've skewed this talk a little bit more towards the environmental angle uh, and hopefully I get everything right. Uh, my background is physics and astronomy. Uh, and then the other thing, I've, I've tried to highlight some of the key talking points uh, to try to zero in on what are the things you actually should take home tonight and think about. So uh, with that said, uh, again, thank you for having me. And we're going to start with sort of the image I think that most people have of light pollution uh, when they think of it in their, in their mind, uh, which is that uh, you are orbiting the Earth and you're looking down and you see the classic what's called the blue marble image from NASA. So they had a a satellite which still orbits today and takes pictures at night um, and it does a variety of other things but one of the things that it can do is, is take pictures at night and, and it does look sort of beautiful that, that you can see where all of the beautiful people of the world live and you know where they live by the bright spots and those bright spots of course is light at night so we see all of the obvious places right we see boston we see new york city we can pick those out really well we can see los angeles uh, and then we can see all of the interconnecting uh, networks uh, that, that take us from place to place. So you can see where all of the, the U.S. highways are and so on. Uh, but then you see some other peculiar things um, that, that usually stand out to at least a few people. And I'm going to annotate it here for those who might not see it. You might see something down here and you're going to see something up here. Uh, and and um, usually I do sort of a question and answer part at this point. So I'm just going to sort of give you a hint. It has nothing to do with the traditional lights that, that we're gonna be talking most of this presentation, but I think it's sort of interesting because most of you are very focused on the environment, as I am too. Uh, and, and something I learned along the way is, I thought this was an artifact, maybe some, some bad data that was a glitch in the system, but it, it appears year after year, and in fact, it just seems to sort of get worse year after year. And these couple spots and a few others in very remote areas, for anybody who's lived out west, there's not a lot out in these regions, west Texas to, to eastern New Mexico and the north and south Dakota. Those are actually oil and gas fields. So uh, the north one is the back end oil fields that everybody I'm sure here is familiar with. Uh, and there's an interesting statistic, which is that the burn off, so whether they're just venting the gas, which we know methane is a very heavy greenhouse gas, or you're just literally burning it off called flaring, 
uh, the amount of gas that's wasted, and particularly from flaring, uh, the statistic is somewhere around 500 billion cubic feet per year wasted across the country. That's just the US, which puts us in fourth place for the world. Uh, that amount of energy being wasted, so it's, it's greenhouse gases, it's energy wasted that could be used, and it's light pollution, uh, is enough to, from, from my rough calculations, enough to supply um, all of America for about 24 days or so. So that's an enormous amount of energy waste that's hitting all of the places that we don't want to hit. And um, in particular, it's sort of noticeable from this, this light pollution image. Okay, so move on to our first slide. So let's zoom into our local area. Uh, this is from the same data set. This is zooming into southern New England. And we see, again, the sort of the ob obvious culprits. We see major city areas that are very bright. Uh, we see the interconnecting highways, but then we can also start to pick out some little towns. Uh, for example, even these little tiny dots you see, those are, those are city centers from small towns. Uh, the town that I live in, Pepperell, Massachusetts, uh, which I believe has around 11,000 people or so, uh, you can actually see from space. And we have no major shopping plazas. Uh, we don't have a major downtown, and you can see it from space. And that, that just sort of shows you, this is just one angle of looking at what light pollution is, and there's a lot of other facets to it. Um, but if you just look at it purely as energy waste, there's an awful lot of it. Uh, so what we want to cover in this talk is what exactly is light pollution when we talk about light pollution? Uh, what are some of the key terms you should sort of pick up in your mind? Uh, is it in fact changing over time? Is it static? Uh, is it growing? Is it shrinking? Uh, what are the consequences to the environment, people, human health, and so on? Uh, if we do nothing. Some really simple solutions. Um, so it might get a little depressing in the middle, but I assure you that we have some really simple solutions that we have right now to solve this problem um, any day now, if we want to. And then I'm going to close with some, some fun things to look at if you have dark skies. So first of all, uh, what exactly is light pollution? So this now, now we're back to Earth here. And this is an image I took of the Milky Way from Westford at the uh, Wallace Observatory during a class night. And so now we're looking at the Milky Way, we're looking up, and we see the Milky Way. It's sort of legible, uh, but there's some funny coloring going on on the side. So let's, let's dig into what exactly the definition is. Uh, there's lots of definitions, in fact, if you look online or in different, different resources. The one I, would, I like the best is actually probably the simplest, which is the inappropriate or excessive use of art, artificial light. And in another sense, because we're using electricity or other fuel sources, it's energy waste. Uh, and so a little story about how that image got so distorted. So you might wonder why we have so much light pollution at an observatory. Uh, in fact, that amount of light pollution, so this is just a typical Canon Rebel uh, camera on a tripod pointing up, taking a, a 60 second image, um, something just about any one of us could do at home. Uh, and two 25 watt red bulbs from our domes, because the students were getting set up, were shining out into the sky. And so it reflected off the haze that's, that's above the observatory and reflected right back down to the camera lens. So I just want to sort of have us wrap our head around that, that just a few lights that are completely unshielded shining directly up can actually make a fairly big impact. And so this light sort of goes everywhere and then it comes back at us and it, it, it washes out the stars. But there's a lot of other things we need to worry about with light pollution as well. So let's go into some of the key definitions. So there's, there's different types. There's glare. So glare, uh, you can see this little guy here. He's not too happy. He was probably trying to sleep. He has this really terrible, bright, unshielded street light, uh, often called a, a cobra head luminaire uh, because it looks sort of like a cobra head. Uh, and it's unshielded. It's very bright. It's, it's making it very difficult for him to see. It's bothering him. It's causing discomfort. That's glare. Sky glow, it's the brightening of the, of the sky, uh, reflecting off the cloud or the haze. Uh, and then light trespass, uh, that's light going where you didn't intend it to go. So that light actually did have a purpose. Uh, and we're not saying, I should mention this now. So in the dark sky community, we're not saying everything needs to be black at night. Uh, we're not saying that remove all lights. We're saying be responsible with the energy you're using use it for the intended purpose. So the, the idea of this light had a purpose. It was supposed to light the street so this guy could walk across the street or a car driving down the road. 
uh, but it's going all over the place. So that's a lot of energy that doesn't need to be over there that could have been controlled or used less of. Uh, and then there's a fourth thing that um, has become more and more prevalent in, in research and literature, which is the color temperature or color appearance, sometimes called CCT on the, on the side of a box of, of lights that you purchase at, at any box store. And that has also a, a sort of a amplification effect in a lot of different ways, as we'll see going forward. So let's dig into glare a little bit further. Uh, here's a couple images. Uh, I like to pick on the area I live in. So these are towns around where I live, um, Groton and Pepperell. And these are some examples of glare situations that are not good. Uh, and essentially, we're talking about, ex again, excessive brightness that causes visual discomfort. This effect gets particularly worse uh, the older you get. So even um, as I'm in my 40s now, I can start to see that effect when I drive home. I drive home at night uh, from the observatory. And I'm noticing uh, more and more um, particularly at the talks I give, and, and I think other people in the field notice this as well, uh, older people come up and say, I can't see anymore, I cannot drive anymore. And that has to do with not just the increase in light pollution, but the type of light that's changed. So uh, we used to have what's called high pressure sodium um, since I think the past 50 or 60 years. And uh, just in the last few years, as in anywhere from a year to past five or six years, a lot of our street lights and other lights along the roadways have changed. They've been changed out for good reason. We want to save carbon. We want to save energy. We want to save money. Uh, but some of the early adopters had some issues. And so in this particular example on the left there, I was driving home in a snowstorm, much like we had last night. And in fact, this, the inclement weather actually amplifies this effect. Uh, so this is a very poorly shielded, overly bright light, which has too much blue content on top of it. And that light uh, causes a significant amount of glare. And in fact, there's a crosswalk right in that glare pattern right there. Uh, there's a sign you can barely read. And if there was a pedestrian coming out, uh, the glare causes a decrease in contrast to your eye, which makes it also unsafe to the pedestrian. If they're trying to cross, I might, might not be able to see them if I wasn't being careful. Um, in the bottom right is an example of uh, a light that was intended to walk, uh, illuminate a uh, walkway in front of a store, the problem is it was pointing directly across the street into a T. So the person coming out at a stop sign is going to get hit with that light and not be able to see left or right as they make that turn. So that's also safe, uh, not very safe. Uh, okay, light trespass, like I said before, is, is when the light goes beyond where you were supposed to be putting it. So uh, on the left example is a drugstore uh, with a LED wall pack. Uh, wall pack lighting is typically supposed to be mounted underneath a surface or uh, pointed downwards. This time they pointed at 90 degrees. So it's pointing horizontal, which is not the way you're supposed to mount this light. And it's emitting in all different directions. It's illuminating buildings across the street, a uh, person's house. Um, honestly, you could read a book uh, from a few hundred feet away for just from that light. And I sort of made a rough calculation that that light alone, just one light, is wasting about 130 kilowatts per year. So that's an enormous amount of energy just from one light. Uh, so my little diagram here is just to show you that it doesn't mean that you can't have the light. It just means control it, uh, perhaps add a shield, perhaps when you change the fixture or change the bulb, put it in a slightly different configuration, say a floodlight, point it a little bit more down, and keep your neighbors happy so that uh, you can still have your light uh, but they can still have their stars, and um, you're not disrupting their sleep. Sky glow. Uh, so th these are uh, images. Uh, this is what we call an all-sky camera. It can see 180 degrees, and it snaps a picture about every four minutes at Wallace Observatory. Uh, and we use this, uh, we actually originally installed this so that we could see remotely from campus. So before our students drive all the way from Boston and drive two hours, we wanted them to be able to see, are the weather conditions good enough to observe? But what we also found is this is a really good calibration uh, to figure out how is our sky actually, the quality of our sky changing over time. Uh, and so to orient yourself, uh, to, in the bottom of the image, that's due south, and the top is, is north. Uh, to the west, you would see Boston and Lowell and Chelmsford, and to the east on the right, you would see towns like uh, Groton and um, Pepperell. So you'll notice, of course, that it's considerably brighter on the left side, the east side, and that's because, of course, those cities are very built up. What's changed in my uh, 12 years or so at working at the observatory is the south, and it's sort of unfortunate because uh, most of the objects we look at are planetary objects and those, those orbit and pass across the sky in the south. 
And what's happened is, uh, for example, towns like Littleton and Westford have uh, become considerably, considerably built up just in the last few years. And we've seen our sky change enormously. Uh, when I started, the Milky Way was readily available on a nice summer night. Uh, now we can often, often barely see it. Some nights we can't see it at all. So qualitatively we can, and anecdotally, we can definitely say it's changed. Uh, if you talk to most people in town, in the area, uh, I think they would say the same thing. Uh, so we, we think there's something changing, but you know, being scientists, we, we need to really actually try to quantify that. So the, again, the light should have a clear purpose. And this is uh, just the same image, but in a different night where it's cloudy. And this gives you a little bit better representation. Um, so again, you can see that what we call light dome in the Southeast. Uh, that's from several of the new strip malls, car dealerships and so on. And in the right, that's actually one single light uh, that red light, that's one of those cell phone red blinking lights to make sure a plane doesn't hit it. So nothing we can do about that. That light is serving a purpose. It has to be there, but maybe uh, some of this other development could be could be dealt with. And there's been lots of studies. Uh, you don't need to read all of this, but basically um, several of the governmental organizations have also studied this. They, they've been looking at the street lights uh, and their impact on a variety of issues, driver safety as well as uh, light pollution. And uh, they've sort of figured out the same thing that I think scientists already know, which is that the spectral power um, distribution, which is essentially like how much energy per unit of color, uh, we'll get into what exactly that is. So where, how much light is being emitted, say in blue versus red makes a difference. The lumen output, that's how bright it is. The distribution, is it being shielded? Is it being controlled? Is it going where you want it to go? And, and that sort of uh, boils down to, uh, are you allowing too much light to go up into space? Uh, and so we can see exactly where that kind of uplight comes from. Uh, and one of, the, one of the reasons I think we're starting to see more of it uh, on the local level is because LEDs are enormously efficient and they're enormously affordable to operate. So you sort of have this, what I call a rebound effect. It's become sort of ubiquitous. It's really easy to install. Uh, they're sort of easy to justify initially that, well, I can put more of these things up. I can make them brighter thinking that they're gonna make you safer, easier to navigate. In fact, it's just the opposite. It actually makes it harder to navigate because your eye can't contrast that well in the dark when the light is too bright. And then if you look at these uh, lights that were put up at the Pepper Library, uh, at least 50% of that light is going into space, serving zero purpose. Now, the other thing is that these lights were subsidized by the state. As are the lights to the right uh, at our fire one of our fire stations, those lights were also subsidized. Uh, and so these are part of either, you know, Green Communities Program or part of the, you know, program through the MAPC or a variety of DOER programs to help towns become more efficient. The problem is they're adding more light and it's very poor quality light often uh, because there wasn't a lot of thought into uh, what do, once we put them up, are they going to look nice? Are they going to be environmentally friendly? They weren't sort of thinking a couple steps ahead. And they sort of, um, the other problem is that they sort of missed a golden opportunity. Instead of saying saving 70%, you maybe could have saved 80 or 90% of your electricity. So we could have gone even further. And the problem then is uh, you're only subsidized once. So then these lights now become uh, sort of a nuisance and the town is on the hook for 100% of the cost to retrofit them. So just six lights here, for example, would cost a town that has no money to over $2,000. Uh, so it's important to sort of think your way through this a little bit and put a little bit of thought. Um, and hopefully the, the conclusions I come to in the end will sort of help everybody to know that you don't need to be a lighting engineer to design your way out of this. Um, the tools are right there as long as you just sort of think and ask a couple questions on your way into installing new lights. Here's a really sort of extreme example, but I think it's important because these are popping up more and more um, throughout the world. And I know of at least two or three in Massachusetts that have popped up so far. Uh, these are LED grow houses. Uh, and so they are used to grow a variety of things more efficiently, um, supposedly. And they are, for example, used to grow things like lettuce, in this case, sometimes tomatoes, sometimes marijuana. And none of those are bad purposes, but the problem is that these unshielded grow houses, they often use pink or purple, high power LEDs to, to force the plants to grow very fast. And when there's no curtains, it can literally turn the sky pink or purple from, you know, up to two or three towns away. Uh, so they, they did deal with this problem. That problem is, has been solved by putting curtains completely around the grow house. Uh, but those are things why we sort of need to think about things before we allow them to happen and, and maybe provide a little bit of guidance or even regulation before they go up. So we mentioned color temperature. Uh, 
I'm going to show it in a few different ways because everybody sort of learns a little bit differently. Uh, this is sort of purely just a sort of a color palette uh, representation of when we talk about this number, CCT, and it's, it's on a Kelvin scale. So that's why there's a Kelvin and it's in degrees. Uh, and so it's called the color temperature. And it's sort of a general representation of how the, that light appears to the human eye. Okay. Uh, so the lights that we all grew up with uh, were warm white and they are around 2700 K. That's, that's the rough approximation in terms of LEDs. These are all LEDs, by the way. And as you go bluer and bluer, the number is going to get higher. As you get redder and redder or warmer, as some people say, uh, it's going to be a lower number. Uh, so the early street lights that have been installed, uh, for example, or maybe the lights you initially got from Mass Save uh, were probably around 4,000K. Uh, some, some early street lights might have even been 5,000K. The newer ones are more like 3,000K. Some are even going back down to 2,000K. And the reason they're trying to push warmer and warmer is because there is a demand. And the original high pressure sodium lights were, were about 2,000K. So we're trying, many people are trying to get back to where we were because we were sort of, we've grown up with that color light and it's more comfortable and it's more pleasing. And in fact, it's easier to see at night. So for those who like to dig into spectrums, this is a little bit um, more detail, but here we just to just for the sake of sort of qualitative comparison you see the sunlight is a broad spectrum it's got all the colors of the rainbow uh then we switch to incandescent when lights were first invented and you have very little blue light but a lot of wasted infrared energy so those were no good either and we switched to compact fl fluorescence for a little bit uh those were also a disaster because they put a lot of mercury into our water in our in our um in our soil so then fortunately people came up with LEDs. Uh, LEDs have in fact been around for several decades, but we figured out how to make uh, a broad spectrum color. And basically what's happening with an LED is you have a blue LED. It's actually literally blue, very, very blue. And they coat uh, the light bulb with some phosphorescent paint. And it changes the color and sort of, your eye sort of merges those two colors uh, to sort of come up with a peak somewhere in the middle. And so it sort of tricks the eye into I got, sorry, I got muted, I think, for a second. Can everybody hear me? Okay, good. All right. Okay. So this is just to dig in a little bit further. Uh, the, the takeaway here is just to show you that as you go, again, as you go farther and farther up the Kelvin scale, uh, the blue light becomes more and more dominant. So for example, compared to the old high pressure sodium, uh, you have about three times more blue light in your nighttime environment from these 4,000 K street lights than you did before. So the question is, is that bad? Does that matter? Uh, so here, here's a little bit why it matters. Uh, this slide's a little dense, so don't feel like you need to um, absorb everything here. But the takeaway I want you to sort of have is, um, the high pressure sodium had the spectrum of the, the actual, the top area here, let me annotate it. So this here is the high pressure sodium, this colored part. Um, the 4000K is here. So you can see what a difference it is over time, right? Um, and there's something called Rayleigh scattering. I, we don't need to go into too much of the physics of this, but basically what it is, Rayleigh scattering is the reason why our sky is blue in the first place. And the reason it's blue is because all of that blue light you saw from the sunlight, that gets scattered in every di different direction. Blue light behaves differently in our atmosphere as scattering. So it goes in every direction. There's, it doesn't really have a directionality. Uh, and that's why our sky is blue. And the same thing happens if we're emitting. It doesn't matter if it's the sun emitting the light or us on Earth. That blue light is going to go everywhere you didn't want it to go. And so by that fact alone, it's not going to hit a target. It's going to be scattered away, and therefore, it's literally just energy waste. And so you, right off the bat with these LEDs, you are losing anywhere from 17 to 30 percent of your energy to going everywhere you didn't think it was going to go. And that has a huge impact on the uplight or the, the sky glow, because if it's going everywhere, that means it's generally raising the, the ambient brightness of the sky. And so while that's really bad for us astronomers, it's also bad for 
the homeowner, it's bad for the taxpayer because that's a lot of wasted energy. Okay. Um, so one way we can we can try to quantify what exactly is happening is we can try to measure it from space. So there is a satellite that's been orbiting uh, since I think about 2012, and it's still orbiting. And every year they publish um, some publicly available data. Uh, you can you can actually access this data at lightpollutionmap.info. Um, and what it does is it, it, ma it has a variety of environmental packages that's monitoring various different things, you know, uh, for climate change. And they also have this device that can in monitor uh, literal energy waste in the form of light uh, that's being emitted up into space. Uh, so that's really exciting, and it was really useful. Um, and I'm just going to cycle through the last um, several years so you can sort of see how Massachusetts has changed. So you can sort of see that it's it's definitely expanded, but it's not entirely even either. Uh, certain points it looks bigger than other times. Uh, and what we're looking at is intensity. So the, the redder or yellow areas are more intense waste. Those are the cities. And the really black areas we do see sort of generally disappearing. They're sort of getting crowded out. Um, but it's not really an even trajectory. So the question is, well, what's going on here? And the problem is, as once I dug into it, is that um, this red line, that's what the satellite can actually see. It turns out as just in the same time period, so around 2012, almost everybody had high pressure sodium lights. Uh, and then these new type of white LEDs were invented around 2014. They started becoming rapidly installed across the state as, as state subsidy programs uh, and efficiency programs installed them from around 2015 or on. The problem is this satellite isn't seeing those new type of lights, or at least not all of them. They're not seeing the blue portion. Uh, so it's a limitation. So we're, in fact, we're seeing growth at around 2.2% a year. Okay, so that's the, that's sort of the accepted figure now. This is where we get into why it's one of the fastest growing environmental problems. At 2.2% a year, we're growing, but we're also not seeing all of this blue light. So from up in space, we, we still don't have an instrument that can even fully quantify how bad this problem is getting. We know it's increasing uh, year over year, but we don't know for sure how bad it is. Uh, but this, this map is useful on a qualitative level locally. And I just want to show you um, just in a, in a few years how much things have changed. So the dark blue areas are almost nearly pristine areas, sort of a rarity in New England. Uh, but there's towns around, you know, Ashby and Townsend, especially as you get near the Quabbin, uh, very, very dark areas. Those areas you could definitely see the Milky Way. Obviously, Lowell, you can't see the Milky Way. The areas in sort of a cyan or light blue green, you can just barely see it on some nights. So this is 2012, and this is 2020. So I'll kind of go back and forth. So this tells us a lot. This tells us that those sort of pristine habitats, uh, which humans want to look at stars, but also creatures need darkness to survive, are, are swiftly disappearing. Fortunately, we do have a very easy tool, uh, a couple of them, uh, to, to really be sure of what's going on. So we have something you can purchase. Uh, it's called an SQM or sky quality meter that can measure it. They're actually calibrated and you can make actual scientific measurements with them. They're, they're fairly inexpensive. Uh, and you can go to the center of your town and then compare it with, say, conservation land. And you can figure out how dark your sky is. And they use a, a scale of brightness uh, that astronomers use. The other thing you can do is your eyeballs. Uh, you can, th this group called Globe at Night has come up with something really cool. Every month they have a challenge uh, for people to go out during the new moon night. It's, it's usually about a week long. Uh, they take data for each month. And you, there's actually an app for your phone. And you just enter in, they pick a constellation that's really easy to find. For example, this month I believe it is Orion. So I think everybody here could probably find Orion's belt. And they want you to count how many stars in Orion you can see. And you match it up with a picture that they show and you click it and you submit it and you tell them your location. And they're actually using it to come up with Earth-based uh, maps uh, from, from human reported observations. And it turns out that's actually a really um, great uh, analog to, to the calibrated device. In fact, they can go back and forth easily and they match up quite well. So the human eye uh, can match pretty well with this calibrated meter and they can actually make 
useful scientific maps of that now. So uh, for reference, for example, 20.2 magnitude on this scale that we use uh, is where you, you can't see the Milky Way anymore. In the town I live in, uh, we can just barely see it. We're at 20.44 uh, on a typical new moon night. Uh, so you can see that the Milky Way, this is from a picture I took the other night, uh, you can just barely see the Milky Way above the background. And I sort of think of it, the, I mentioned the Milky Way a lot because we sort of use that as the canary in the coal mine, so to speak. If, if you're losing that, if you sort of say, that's gonna be my threshold for where things are getting bad, that tells you that the problem has become um, considerably bigger. Uh, this is a, so we have one of these devices that's actually mounted on a pole at the observatory. And we've been monitoring the situation uh, over westward since 2013. And it was looking really depressing uh, for the first few years because the trajectory you can see, uh, this is an inverse scale, by the way. So uh, we could, see, when I first started, we could see the Milky Way and then we crossed that red line where we could no longer see the Milky Way on most nights. And it was getting really, really bad to the point where a lot of actual astronomy couldn't be done. So, you know, important research on hazardous asteroids or, or these new exoplanets with, with new planets that are, you know, just being discovered, we couldn't see, literally couldn't see them anymore. And then we got really involved uh, with the area, with developers, with the town. Uh, and around 2019, uh, Westford decided to change the streetlights. And we petitioned them hard to use good quality lights, uh, to use a lower color temperature, uh, to use better shielded lights, and they did that. And we were really excited. And we sort of saw maybe a moderate flattening out. Uh, I wouldn't say it got darker. Uh, and then they did something else. They dimmed the lights by 50% because that's one of the, the fantastic things about LED over the old technology is you can actually dim them just like you dim a wall switch in your house. And when they dimmed them, uh, I knew they were gonna do it at some point and I called the town manager's office and I said, uh, you know, we've been waiting for you guys to, dim the lights, when are you going to do that? And they said, oh, we've actually done it months ago. We didn't even know because it turns out the human eye is so adaptable. And in fact, no one in town noticed. Zero people complained, zero people noticed that they dimmed the lights by 50% and they saved their energy uh, by another factor of, of two. And that's even compared to the old high pressure sodium. Uh, so, you know, in the end, you're talking about a savings of 85% versus 70%, which is pretty huge. When you, if you start adding up all these towns, if everybody did that, that's really exciting. Uh, what we don't know is this, it seems like it, the situation is stabilized. We don't know if the last year has been due to COVID and, or is it because uh, development has slowed in the area? Uh, and so it's sort of to be continued, but we are sort of cautiously optimistic that perhaps with enough engagement in the community level uh, that we can at least slow down the pace um, and maybe even potentially make it a little bit darker. There are a few anecdotes across the country of uh, individuals or groups uh, through the IDA doing the same thing and seeing either flattening out or, or at least a moderate amount of, of darkness returning at night. So why are the LEDs such a big deal? Well, the, the efficiency and their, their sort of dominance in the, in the market for lighting has grown exponentially. Uh, when they started, they were, you know, sort of on par with high pressure sodium, and now they are several orders, um, several factors um, more efficient. So they're incredibly efficient now, and they're only increasing. And what this is going to do for us is actually help us get to our, our carbon goal. So I'm sure everybody's been following, you know, the climate bills in the state and several states around us. Uh, everybody's sort of concerned that are we going to meet our climate goals? And one of the areas, sort of the low hanging fruit where we can actually achieve some of these goals is lighting. Uh, so um, that efficiency curve is sort of inverted here. So this is actually uh, showing how over time, just in a few years, we can actually achieve uh, some pretty significant changes. Uh, in, in fact, I think they're saying here 51% savings in terms of energy use. Uh, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, much better than even say some of the heating or cooling or you know refrigeration. Uh, but for some reason that light pollution is increasing. So that sort of tells you something. So that we're we're using less energy per light, uh, but the light pollution overall all right I got muted again. Uh, so for those who didn't hear me, so uh, 
Uh, basically, what I think what this is saying is that, yes, we're becoming more efficient per light, uh, but in fact, we must be using more light and, and, and more wastefully uh, over time for it to be increasing at that rate. Okay, there we go. Uh, so this slide uh, I just made this week, and so I'm going to put a little disclaimer and say that I am, I am not a climate scientist. Uh, I'm not an energy analyst, but I, I worked backwards uh, from, from several uh, sources, and I took sort of the assumption uh, that's been sort of, I think, accepted by both industry and, and, and activists that somewhere around 30% uh, of our light is wasted overall at night. So 30%, that's almost a third. Um, and that's, that's sort of mind-blowing alone that we just sort of accept that about 30% of anything is wasted. Uh, and then we can sort of work forward to say uh, how much actual, you know, climate um, affecting gas in the form of CO2 is that producing. So just in Massachusetts alone, that's, you know, looking like it's going to be somewhere around 0.2 million metric tons of CO2 per year. Uh, and that turns out to be somewhere around $180 million worth, worth of wasted electricity energy that powers those lights. So that's not a small number. Uh, and if you look at the, the graphic from IDA above, I know it's sort of small, uh, that's from 2011. So that's before the LED revolution. Um, you know, they were talking somewhere around, um, you know, $3 billion uh, for the country. Now we're talking about 6.3 billion. Um, so, you know, with, with sort of hard to understand is, you know, with, that's, you know, a factor of two in just a short amount of years, in 10 years, uh, are we wrong about the math? Are we not catching everything? Well, the truth is we don't even know how many lights are out there. Um, often their lights are underreported. Uh, often parking lot lights are not included in some of these surveys. Uh, so th I think if anything, we need to study this more and sort of categorize how many lights are out there, how much we're wasting, uh, and what exactly is the culprit? Is it the street lights? Is it the parking lot lights? Is it residential lights? You know, one thing we notice uh, are that homes are installing LED floodlights everywhere around the perimeter of their home and leaving them on all night. Um, we have these post-top uh, faux gas lamps that are going up for, for decorative pur purposes, but they're on all night. And they're, if they're wasting 50, 60% of their energy, um, that's not good either. So that's some of the energy waste portion. Now let's dig into how it affects living creatures. So this is probably to me, as I've learned more about this personally, the more disturbing fact, you know, it's, it's bad for my job and, and I, re I personally just love the stars and I would hate to see them disappear. But more importantly, uh, people and animal health and our, and our general quality of life here is, is even more important. And so the American Medical Association came up with a really strongly worded report in 2016 that's had a lot of influence. And it's not just one report. It's a, it's a sort of a, a distillation of a many, many studies over decades and pulling together the threads that I mentioned earlier, whether it's from astronomers, traffic safety specialists, medical doctors, uh, psychiatrists, and you know a whole wide range of environmentalists sort of taking together. There's a lot of different threads to this light pollution issue. And, and they came up with some really kind of easy to follow conclusions. And I've highlighted that the, really the two things you need to take out of this is that uh, the color temperature, so how the blue content matters. And they said at the time, so remember this is 2016, they said 3000K should be the max. And part of the reason they chose that number was because, well, the LED technology had not gone too much warmer than that. It was not readily available. And so they settled on 3000K. Uh, we'll get to the, what the number should be a little later. Uh, the other thing is that really simply just properly shield the light, uh, that these LEDs are, are so bright uh, that they really need some extra shielding, particularly for, for traffic safety, pedestrian safety, uh, and so on. And these ideas have been endorsed by the Massachusetts Municipal Association, the Massachusetts Medical Society, the Department of Energy, the WHO, even GE Lighting, who makes some of these lights, uh, the NIH, and even recently the, uh, this group, the U.S. Insurance Agencies, because um, you know none, none, nobody wants to see uh, the negative effects of these lights. And, and let's get into exactly why they wrote this report. So the key thing is, and I think a lot of people, this, this story sort of gets reported a lot now, uh, whether it's a you know, popular newspaper or NPR, 
and that is that light has an effect on your circadian rhythm. Your circadian rhythm is essentially your clock in your brain that tells you what time to get up, what time to go to sleep, what time to hunt, what time to fish, what time to mate. And in fact, almost all animals have uh, some form of this, this circadian rhythm clock in their brain. Um, and the gland that is controlling that uh, is the uh, pineal gland. And the thing it is excreting is melatonin. Uh, and the melatonin helps regulate uh, your sleeping patterns, for example. So on the left, we have an image of the eyeball. Uh, we don't need to focus too much on that. Other than that, uh, there, there's, there's a few different sensors. The rods and cones form the image, uh, whether it's dark or light out. Uh, but there's this other third type of cell that we are aware of, but we didn't know what the function was until a few years ago. Uh, they're called ganglion cells. And in fact, they don't form images per se, but what they do look at is different colors and the intensity of those colors. Um, and particularly of importance is they're looking at how bright the blue light is in the room. So even someone who is blind and cannot form images in their eye and has uh, underdeveloped or damaged rods and cones can have working ganglion cells and they will still have a circadian rhythm despite that. Uh, and so there's a lot of effects that disrupting your circadian rhythm has. And uh, the reason for that is, I'm gonna use my pen here to annotate this a little bit better. So our vision is this photopic part here. That's what we can see. We can see a little bit into the blue, but mostly towards the yellow and orange and red. And we can't really see the blue part. The blue part, of course, here's that blue spike from the LED. And it, it's like a key in a keyhole. These ganglion cells are looking for this. They're looking for the color of the sky to tell it, are you at noontime? Should you be up and hunting, going fishing, going to gather food, uh, searching for a mate? Or is it nighttime and you should go to bed? And um, like I said earlier, uh, one way we could sort of verify that was actually by showing discrete LEDs. So instead of a wide spectrum, just a specific color. Uh, and so these, these this chart on the right shows, what they did was they took one of these, these uh, a blind person who has functioning ganglion cells, but not the rods and the cones. And they shown a green LED and no effect. They shown a blue LED matching the same spike that we see uh, in the wide spectrum LEDs and the melatonin rate the, the dropped immediately uh, and the effect is quite dramatic uh, i've seen some studies that says that you know under a minute of exposure of a very bright light uh, can actually delay your clock by about an hour for a day at least so that it has a very immediate pronounced effect and can actually carry over to the next day so and you know alone it's just sort of a nuisance to not be able to sleep uh, but further societally, uh, there's something else happening because, of course, if you can't sleep, um, you are going to have problems. You're going to have trouble concentrating. You're going to have trouble driving. That's dangerous. Uh, you may have psychological issues from not sleeping. Uh, but to control that, you might be going to the doctor. And that's what this study showed, which was that if you live in a more light polluted area, you are not only uh, going to be prescribed more more the probability of you be prescribed say something like um, Ambien to help you sleep is much higher not only is the probability that you're going to be prescribed that medicine you're going to be probably prescribed a higher dosage as well so these drugs are not minor they have significant side effects and this is a cost to insurance this is a cost to public health uh, that if people are having to take these intense drugs to sleep because we left the lights on too much, um, that's not really a good outcome either. Uh, this was a recent study just last year, and I, I found this e extremely disturbing, but not surprising. So we know that sleep is associated with a variety of mental health issues. Uh, and what they found was that an increase of, and often, by the way, in literature, if you try to search up uh, any light pollution articles, they're often referred to as LAN or ALAN, -A artificial light at night. Uh, and it was associated with a, an increase of mood disorders, uh, and, and particularly anxiety disorders, including bipolar disorder, specific phobias, and major depressive disorder. Uh, and this, this effect was, was also seen particularly in adolescents. 
and even more so in adolescents and urban environments. Uh, so this is not good either. If, if we're inducing or increasing the chances of psychological effects, particularly on children, uh, I think we have to do something about that. Uh, and then we have wildlife. Uh, millions, you know, they, they've I think it's pretty well accepted now that millions of birds die every year uh, because of, for example, skyscrapers leaving the lights on at night. Uh, animals being confused. So turtles are the easy uh, example. Uh, they migrate often in the wrong direction. Uh, this is the reason why a few years ago, Miami had to change all of their lights along the coast because the sea turtles uh, were beaching themselves. They were trying to follow the full moon and instead they saw Miami and were beaching themselves on the beach. So they did do something about it, but it's sort of an easy example because as soon as they uh, change the lights, the problem was extremely minimized. Uh, it confuses them about when to mate, they'll miss their opportunity, uh, when to find and hunt their food, it'll, they'll miss again, miss their opportunity because they're, they're hunting at the wrong time of day, maybe they get too tired. Uh, pollinators uh, in some cases. Now, we're not just talking about bees here, we're talking about our nighttime pollinators. So butterflies, moths, uh, and other creatures that pollinate that we don't normally think of, uh, their, their usefulness is, is reduced by 62%, and that has a, a pretty big impact on agricultural. Uh, we'll see that again uh, in the next slide. Fireflies, uh, which I'm, I'm a very big fan of fireflies. Uh, there was a recent study, this was done in Massachusetts by a Tufts researcher. A lot of people assumed that the number one cause of their decline, we know they're declining, we know their populations are collapsing, and the assumption was it must be pesticides. Well, in fact, the number one cause was uh, popula uh, their, their habitat decline. So people disrupting, say, rotten logs, they, they like to plant their larvae in for the next season. The second leading cause was light pollution. Uh, they are attracted out of their area and they miss their opportunity to do the, the things that they need to do, communicate, uh, and um, other fireflies can't see them because it's so bright and it causes a population collapse. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much on this slide, but there also has been study on agri agriculture. Uh, for example, a uh, particular type of um, fruit thistle uh, has a resulting 13% reduction in yield. And that has to do with the disruption of the whole ecosystem, the whole life cycle, whether it's increasing pests that you don't want, decreasing the pollinators, uh, confusing the plants, uh, photosynthesis cycle. Uh, so this is really a broad spectrum of issues, and especially as we're sort of concerned with climate change in the long run of being able to produce food, particularly locally, this is something we really need to plan as we plan out the future of our towns and cities, is to take into consideration that maybe you don't want to put a really bright sign or a street light across the field um, from, a, from a food source for the town. Okay, so after all that depressing stuff, fortunately, the solutions are really easy. We do not need to invent, invent any new technology. Uh, they are right here, right now. So first one uh, is buying better fixtures when you install the next one. Uh, it doesn't mean, unless you really want to, that you need to rip out all of your fixtures tonight, but the next time you change it, uh, just choose something on the right side. So for example, when you go into a big box uh, home improvement store, you often see a wall of lights and it's sort of intense because there's a, you know, 20, 30 lights and you're trying to figure out what's the right one to choose. Well, there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can look at this chart and sort of see generally in a, in a qualitative sense, is the thing that's glowing, the part that's emitting, buried in, in the fixture. If I can see it directly and it's hurting my eyes to look at it, that's not the one you wanna use. Is it shining directly up? That's not the one you wanna use. And some of these now have um, IDA or International Dark Sky Association approval stickers on the side. Those ones are probably going to be pretty good. Uh, we wouldn't approve them unless they were they were on the better side of the on, on the on the ledger. Uh, the other thing is, particularly with floodlights, um, as we see them going up more and more, and they're left on and all at night. Um, sometimes the motion trigger is is malfunctioning. The next time you buy them, uh, buy one. Some of the newer ones have shields, and I've, I've checked; they do not cost more if they have a shield. Uh, so that sort of prevents them from going directly up, and they still provide plenty of light uh, as a spotlight where you need it to go. Uh, it just controls it better. Solution two is choosing a color. Uh, so now 2700K is, again, this is a warm white color. This is, the, this is a pretty uh, good compromise here. It's, it's not too blue, and, and if you don't like too red, it's not too red. Uh, but these still add a little bit of blue light, 
uh, but they are much less blue light than the 4000K. Um, and several towns in Massachusetts have them, Needham, Pittsfield, Wellesley, uh, Pepperell, uh, where I live, and several other towns around here are also considering them. Uh, and, you know, the thing is, this, this comes up a lot. Well, better light must cost more. It turns out it costs exactly the same to choose good light. Uh, and so you might be wondering, okay, so how do I fix this at home? I can't control my street lights, but I can control at home. Well, fortunately on all lighting packages, they, they tell you exactly what the color temperature is. You see there, this, this bulb uh, is 2700K. Uh, and that goes nicely with this, uh, I think you call it a barn light. It's very well shielded. Uh, it might not have an IDA sticker, but you can look at it right away and say, if I looked at it from the side, I'm not going to be able to see that bulb. That's going to be a great light. Even these lantern lights uh, are interesting because what they actually do now is bury the LED under the top hood and they use uh, little reflectors and diffusers. So you get a little bit of light out the sides, uh, but the, the intense part, the most of the light is not going to be going up. And I would call those acceptable as well. Uh, the three, the third thing is is smart controls. So this this has more to do with the state and municipal level, uh, but this has to do with how you can how you can sort of unlock that additional savings. So it's a cost savings, but it's also an energy savings. Uh, the unfortunate thing of what we found in the state of Massachusetts is that even towns, let's say you started with a hundred watt high pressure sodium, and you chose a good light, say it's a 2700K, uh, 15, maybe it's a 20 watt LED, and then you found it's still too bright because the efficiency has gone up so much with these, uh, you have more than enough light, you can dim it by 50%. Well, even though you're below 25 watts, you're still going to be charged 25 watts. So you might be still charged with um, an extra 50% of your actual usage because the tariff structure, the tariff structure is essentially how power companies have negotiated with the state, what they're able to charge you and get away with. So it's literally like robbery, uh, where the, say a company like National Grid or uh, Eversource is able to charge towns and cities a full rate. So what that's done in turn is sort of de-incentivize towns from dimming. Well, why would I buy that dimming extra feature for a few dollars? Why would I bother turning it down? I'm not gonna recoup the savings. Uh, that's not good for the environment, and it's not good for light pollution. Uh, it's not good for achieving our climate goals. Okay, so where do we stand uh, in this in this region compared to the rest of the country? Well, um, Massachusetts is the only state in New England, uh, and that includes, if you want to include even New York in that, uh, that has not passed an outdoor lighting regulation. The only state. Vermont has passed it, they just decided not to enforce it. Um, but even states like Texas, Arkansas, and Florida have passed these kind of regulations. Um, Massachusetts is not. Uh, we've been trying for even before my time getting involved with this. Uh, but the IDA has, uh, let's see, two sessions ago, we passed uh, the Senate bipartisan and unanimously, which I don't think many things do these days. Uh, and then we just ran out of time in the House. And then last session, uh, we were on a good track. We made it out of the TUE committee, as you know, very few environmental bills did. Uh, we ended up in the Ways and Means Committee, and then COVID hit. Uh, we were on a good track. Uh, we had a lot of good press. Uh, things were looking good. And the things that we were tackling were uh, putting limits. So for any state or municipally funded lighting, it would have to be at a, at a max of 3,000K. Uh, we said that you have to limit up lighting and uh, over lighting. Uh, we said that the Mass DOT and um, DOER needs to study lighting policy and actually put some thought into it. So we were sort of putting it back in their courts to sort of think about, well, how are other countries doing it? How are other states doing it? Put put some thought in, and come up with your own new regulations to see, you know, can we, can we save even further? For example, in Europe, um, many countries use reflectorized roadway markers instead of streetlights, particularly in, in more rural areas. Uh, and they're perfectly safe. So, you know, can we do the same? Do you even need streetlights in certain roads? And then fourth thing is, is that tariff structure. So we would be forcing uh, the state to renegotiate the tariffs so that towns and cities are going to actually be charged for the energy you're using, not for what National Grid feels like charging you. 
Uh, and so we've actually just, the, the new session just started. Uh, the deadline is February 19th, I believe, to submit new bills. And we are gonna be submitting uh, a, um, an updated with a sort of tuned up language. And we've negotiated a little bit with industry to try to see if we can give a little bit to try to, to, try to bring them in a little bit. So we, we provide an exemption uh, for up to 4,000K only in uh, demonstrable safety concerns. We're not sure what they could possibly say you would need 4,000K, but we tried to at least bridge the gap to see if we could bring them along. Uh, so some other ways you can tackle this are state building codes. We did submit building codes uh, earlier uh, in late last year uh, for the state that would have to do with requiring commercial lighting. So that's that's like, um, for example, parking lot lights and a big box store uh, dealing with those kind of lights. Um, we withdrew it to try to tune up the language. We negotiated uh, with the International um, Illuminating Engineering Society and some lighting designers to try to come up with something that would work with their process. Uh, and we hope to resubmit something later this year. Uh, we're exploring to whether state parks and a federally, federally protected land in Massachusetts could possibly um, have some sort of dark sky policy. Uh, we're also pushing in, in lieu of, you know, while we wait for the state law to be passed, uh, ordinances by law. So already seven towns in Massachusetts are, are considering um, IDA, IDA developed um, bylaws uh, in 2021. Uh, and we're also embarking upon a, a larger national effort right now called the MLO or Model Lighting Ordinance. So this would be a framework, not just for Massachusetts, but in fact, the entire country. Uh, I'm on that committee and industry is on that committee as well. So that we have a um, sort of a, um, a combination of, of activists and industry kind of coming together and trying to say, uh, can we come up with something that would work for everybody that we could sort of paste around uh, the state, the not just states, but but the country as a whole, and maybe even lead to potentially some, some federal regulations in the long run. Because what you don't really want in the long run is a patchwork. We may have to do that to help control the problem, but it would be better if you had sort of a top level uh, guidance and for what is considered good or bad lighting. So I, I want you to come away from this talk to say that while this is a very fast growing problem, it's, it's getting bad quickly. Um, the fact is that it's very solvable. Uh, you know, the, the rate I told you is 2.2% a year, uh, at the observatory, we're, we're showing over 4%. So we're locally about twice the national average growth rate. Uh, so I personally find that unacceptable and I hope you do too. And, uh, this picture, I think sort of, to me sells it because, um, a few years ago, one of those massive power outages, uh, one of the grid failures happened and an astrophotographer knew what to do. He, he knew to go outside with his tripod and, and take an image. And while the power was out and his house was running on a generator, he took this beautiful image over his head, uh, over his house, and you can see the Milky Way instantly. Uh, the power came back on and you couldn't see anything at all. You could barely see a single star. And that shows you that this problem is solvable and it's solvable at the speed of light. Uh, and so the thing that we need help with is supporting our calls to action. So we have a Facebook page. Uh, we have a website uh, that's updated occasionally. Uh, once we get the bill submitted, we are going to really need help, especially as new members uh, of the state legislature are being seated uh, and assigned to new committees. We're going to need new uh, co-sponsors. So last session, we had 26 co-sponsors, bipartisan. Um, and we hope that you can join us. Uh, hope that you can call your local legislator, particularly in the House, is, is where we probably need the most help. Uh, and you can also join IDA. Uh, IDA is a, is a great group. Uh, and even if you don't want to join IDA, you can always just help us uh, spread the word. Uh, you can also just talk to your town, uh, talk to your board of selectmen, uh, your planning board, your building inspector, your conservation committee, and just find out what exactly is their policy. Are they following their policy? I, I think often we find that some towns have policies and they're just not even being followed because people haven't really thought about them. Uh, and sometimes it just takes a voice to, to say, um, maybe we should actually uh, request from the builder, you know, do, do something slightly different here. Uh, I'm going to conclude here with uh, some, some pretty pictures just to sort of lighten the mood a little bit. Um, and these are things you can see at night. Uh, this is Comet Neowise uh, that was lit up the sky uh, last summer. Uh, this is our sister galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy. And here's the Orion Nebula. Uh, one of my favorites that's up right now. 
Uh, so with that, I'm going to lead up this graphic. Um, and, and this to me shows sort of is my last slide, uh, how far we've come, which is that just this year, we, we've been sort of battling with, with groups like the Illuminating Engineering Society for a really long time. They're sort of an in industry trade group. Uh, and just this year, IDA and IES joined forces finally and agreed that, you know, there's some five principles, five principles we can agree on, which is make the light useful, make it targeted, use lower light levels. We're, we're using way too much light as it is. We don't need that much light at night to, to find our way around. Uh, control the light, make sure it's going where it's supposed to, and, and do try to, to start using the warmer colored light. So these are really simple. Uh, and, and the fact that industry is, is buying into this now is, is, I think we're on the right track and I think we're gonna get there. So uh, with that, uh, I'm gonna pause and I will answer whatever questions I can. Thank you so much, Tim. That was a wonderful presentation, really eye-opening and motivating. It's encouraging to know that there's something that we can do and you're working on some legislation that will bring some consistency, hopefully, across Massachusetts. Uh, I encourage everybody to um, submit questions either via the chat window or um, to unmute your lines now. One of the, I'll start off by asking the first question, Tim, which is, what are some of the nonprofit environmental organizations that the IDA is allied with to help with this cause? Are there any? Yeah, I can give you a few that have signed on to the bill. Uh, for example, Sierra Club, um, the Appalachian Mountain Club has been a great ally. In fact, we just had our, our um, annual meeting at their headquarters in, uh, in Boston. Uh, and so there's a lot of environmental organizations that are starting, especially the efficiency ones are, are coming online. Uh, especially as we we testified in the in the efficiency hearing at the state house um, a couple years ago, and um, it turns out you know I think there was there's elements that they have thought about but maybe hadn't thought about how a lot of people aren't aware of this tariff structure. I had never I didn't even know what the word tariff meant a few years ago, um, and as we become aware of it, we sort of see how it's sort of in institutionalized that we're we're sort of born to be wasting this money uh, and energy. And uh, I think we all know, probably, I'm guessing by the, by the theme of this, this talk series, that uh, we have to limit the amount of carbon we're putting up in, into the sky. Uh, and this is, a re this is the low-hanging fruit, in my opinion. Uh, this is the easy one, because the technology is here for efficiency. Yeah, and you know, I think a lot of people in our audience tonight and in other programs in, in our database who aren't here on the program tonight care about uh, these issues and they'd be willing to help the IDA uh, however they can. So um, if people wanted to reach out to you after this program, um, do you mind if we share your email address and so forth so that they can communicate with you? I know you get inundated with a lot of requests or questions. So. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to, to answer people. Uh, I get contacted every day <laughs> about it and we, we we, uh, we sort of regionalize it. So um, things sort of more towards the central mass area, I generally handle, and we have people in Western Mass and the Berkshires and the Cape uh, that can handle specific local issues. And if it's sort of a statewide issue, you know, I'd be happy to help as well. Um, and then I'll leave up our, our I'm gonna go back to our Facebook page because that's sort of a easy way, um, our Facebook or our um, WordPress site, because uh, both of those have contact info um, and those are easy to follow. Um, Great, and I can include those in a, the email that we send next week with the recording of this webcast. So Great, thank for, you. Thanks for all the things you do and will do in the future for this. So we'll be on the lookout for um, notification about upcoming legislative efforts. Let's get out there and do this, folks. Um, we're so close. This would be wonderful because otherwise it's a whack-a-mole approach, right? Um, town by town, citizens have to bring it to their town selectmen or their managers or there's urban planners, et cetera, and it can be very arduous. 